We are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another week of Lunch with Lunsford. We're so happy to have you here, and we are joined by our fantastic special guest, Zach Winokur. Zach, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Just going to have a couple minutes of chit chat to allow people to trickle in so they don't miss any of our scintillating content right off the bat. How's everyone doing today? Zach, where are you, where are you beaming in from? It's such a like it's beautiful, ah, great vista. It's a, it's a rainy vista today, but I'm in <laughs> Vermont. Um, actually where I spend a lot of time, usually in the, in the summers, it's a kind of spiritual home for me. Um, and where my company gathers every summer for a big residency. It looks beautiful. The trees are gorgeous. I'm very jealous. Yeah, I'm very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you, Mark? I'm in my living room in, in Porter Square. Um, <clears throat> I do a lot to position myself in a window so that in every Zoom call, I'm like taking a natural light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, someone the other day was like, who's your lighting designer? And I was like, God. <laughs> <laughs> God in the sun. Oh, well, yeah, it is good lighting. It's quite spectacular, I would say. Yeah. So we've got a, a whole bunch of attendees that have trickled in. It's 12.03, being mindful of time. I'm going to turn everything over to Mark, and I will at this point disappear. Zach, thank you again for joining, and I'm excited to watch. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Um, this is really exciting because, Zach, I think, um, I mean, you and I have known each other for, like, maybe two years, maybe two and a half. Yeah. Um, and I feel like it's one of the partnerships that like or relationships where I, I didn't know you prior and then it was just like bam like so much work we've done so much work together it's been such like a high volume of stuff that we've created and like such high potency for having just met you know between between you and ART um so it's exciting to get into this conversation today to I think examine a lot of that breadth of the work um but before we go there I, I I've been asking people in this series to talk a lot just about their origin story. <clears throat> I think that a lot of times when we get into the work and we're having conversations related specifically to the work, um, we forget to talk about like, how did you become a director or what was it about the arts that drew you at sort of an early age? And so I, I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit just off the jump about kind of your uh, history as a dancer, what interested you in dance, sort of all the things that led to you becoming mesh in performing arts? Yeah. Um, well, I was, I, I, I basically was like a soccer player. Um, and then a friend of mine asked if uh, I wanted to join um, him in taking tap dance classes at the JCC um, to get like the footwork on the fields, which I thought was a great idea. And then totally fell in love with tap dancing and, um, you know, started taking dance really seriously like right before my freshman year of high school um and so I grew up in Needham um my parents are both teachers um teachers who teach teachers how to teach basically so there was like a, a, a real culture of learning um and my mom is pretty good uh at sight reading the piano and my great aunt made like the duck sculptures in Boston Commons but uh and my grandmother was a painter but it wasn't like art heavy in the family necessarily, but it was extremely creative and like follow your dreams, follow your passions. Um, and then I went to Concord Academy for high school and um, that was kind of when I started getting really, really serious and uh, about dancing. Um, and I was really lucky to have these uh, two teachers who ran the dance program at Concord, Richard Colton and Amy Spencer, who are two just like phenomenal geniuses and Richard in particular, um, I feel sort of taught me like how an artist's mind should work. Like it was incredibly curious. It was voracious. It was um, omnivorous. And we made a lot of work um, as like a dance company in high school that was all over the place from like, you know, the Lacrimosa and Mozart's Requiem to Bjork with like perfume makers. And it was all over the place. And so I was really lucky to think that like, to kind of grow up in like a super interdisciplinary kind of setting for making new artistic work. And I never really thought about dancing as like a, a narrow field. Um, I thought being a choreographer meant working with musicians, 
working with video artists and set designers and you could talk and you could dance and you could play the violin and you could do whatever you wanted. Um, and so I feel like my imagination was like not really asked to be turned off um, really until like I got to Juilliard. <laughs> right, right, right. It's, it's so, it, the, the, the fact that, you know, I, I like I've heard you say this before, the fact that you took tap as a way to improve your soccer skills, <laughs> which, yeah. you know, we say the theater a lot, like, Oh, bring your lawyers. We're going to teach them how to be better public speakers, or bring your doctors. We're going to teach them how to have you know better better empathy. Yeah. Uh, the the reverse story about like you, you took the tap and it actually lured you away. Um, totally. I mean, I still perfect. love soccer as a sport, though I haven't played it for a very long time. But um, I still have the legs for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chris, so so you go to Juilliard. <clears throat> Yeah. So actually, there were a couple of crazy things that I can't believe my parents let me do when I was in high school, um, which was uh, basically to put me on a train. And uh, I, I, I joined Carol Armitage's dance company when I was 15. Um, so a sophomore in high school. And so I, I moved to New York um, and it was a really crazy time and super wonderful. And Carol, um, for those who don't know about her, was kind of the it girl of the downtown New York City dance scene in the 80s. And kind of combined, she was a star of the Merce Cunningham Dance Company and also of Balanchine's Geneva Ballet. And she sort of synthesized those two styles um, with punk. And so she yeah, was yeah. doing, you know, crazy, she was like the punk ballerina. Um, and she- Dance production of Hair. Um, and then she also did choreography for this um, David Ashby play that we did, directed by Rebecca Tishman, um, a Marie Antoinette adaptation. She, she choreographed right. these crazy punk interventions throughout the play that were amazing. Yeah, and she was a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute a couple of years ago, I think. Um, but she was a really important teacher for me also, and, uh, you know, kind of took me after rehearsal every night to gallery openings, and I kind of got, like, a huge education in the visual art world from her, because, you know, Jeff Koons was designing the sets, David Sally was doing the costumes, um, and, like, it was this crazy, like, Cindy Sherman, Ju Julian Schnabel world um, when I kind of first got to New York. And then I went back uh, to high school in Concord and sort of like went back and forth a bunch and then um, ended up at Juilliard. And um, I think, you know, Juilliard ended up being a really important place for me that I have an incredible devotion to. Um, but when I started, uh, I had a lot of reservations and I think a lot of misunderstandings of what it was. Um, I sort of imagined it as this incredibly fertile ground for artistic development where I'd be surrounded with all of these incredibly talented young people in different disciplines and we'd just be making stuff together. Um, but in fact, it's uh, more of a kind of vocational school um, that teaches you to be a very, very good dancer. Um, but I, I, I felt like my, my creative ambitions were kind of being stifled. Um, and my sophomore year, um, I, I had a very strange kind of lucky opportunity um, to go to the most boring town in Germany called <laughs> Wuppertal um, to work with the Pina Bausch, mm -hmm. who was my hero. Um, and I'd met a couple of her dancers and her ballet master, this woman, incredible woman who like still like smokes cigarettes out the window while like wearing a turban, teaching this almost extinct technique of ballet called Cicchetti Method. Um, and she sort of introduced me to Pina and Pina asked me to come and work with the company. And um, so I, I, I dropped out of school and um, went uh, to Wuppertal, which is like really, it's the kind of place where you, you watch people get off the bus and you understand the war. It's like people are just so sad <laughs> and there's <laughs> nothing there except for a, a, some, this thing called the Schwebebahn, which is this monorail. Yeah. And that's kind of like the most exciting thing. And the the Dunseater Wuppertal works in a, a an old porn theater above a McDonald's. Um, and it's weird that that is get more all German. I wanted. <laughs> get more German than this. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think you know there were there were two kind of like heroes for me in the world of dance and theater. One was Pina Bausch, and the other was William Forsyth. And I was lucky to kind of work with both of them a little bit. Um, and you know. Pina died um, right after she asked me to join the company, so I never kind of returned. But um, they're both both of them had something in common that I tried to like keep with me, which was this sense of the studio being a laboratory mm. where everyone was really deeply um, submerged in their own 
curiosity and line of inquiry. And so you'd sort of walk around and both Bill and Pina would leave their people alone for long periods of time, like after asking them a lot of good questions. And you're just sort of in this study time. Um, and I loved that ethos of like, it felt like very rigorous. It felt very free. It felt like everyone was a creator. Everyone was a choreographer. Everyone had something to contribute. And that Pina was much more of like an editor. Um, and I loved that spirit. I think that I really appreciate that in a big way because I think their work in particular, for me, <clears throat> you know, I think this is the point of dance in a big way, but both of those makers really highlight this, like what the body can say when words fail, like what emotion that can convey, which I think follows through into your work in a big way too. But just thinking about those other ways in which we have to express emotion or point that where words can't get there, they yeah. that work really, for me anyway, might not be true for everyone, yeah. but. Yeah, and I think both Bill and Pina approach it in very different ways because I think Bill has a sense of ballet being language. Like it has syntax, it has grammar. You can be really rigorous about how you spell, how you speak, how you compose essays and sentences and paragraphs. Um, but of course, it's a non-axiomatic language, so we're able to interpret it in whatever way we want. But there's an internal logic that's really, really kind of intensely researched. And with Pina, I think the thing that I love the most about that work is, um, for one, the sense of community in all of her work, partly because that group of dancers, um, at least when I was there, it was people who had been with the company for 40 years. I mean, the person I was staying with was Dominique Merci, who was kind of like the star of the company. And, and he was married to this woman, Malou, who was, they were like two of Pina's first dancers. And then they had a baby together named Thusnelda. And Thusnelda was in the company too. They were all there, like the whole family. Um, and like that ethos, as weird as it is in some ways, was so beautiful because there was this like geological kind of accumulation of language and vocabulary and accountability. And the quality of everything that they did was, you know, just built over 30 years. And I felt like that's the only way to get there. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, this is so illuminating because I, I think a lot about the work that you do specifically and and in your style as a director. And um, what has struck me a lot, and I think it's because it it shares an aesthetic value with work ARTs that you're interested in, but <clears throat> the way in which you can set work kind of anywhere, right? That that you kind of defy what a performance venue should be, and and you can vision in lots of different spaces how to set work and what it means to be doing the work in that space and what that means both for the artist and for the audience. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about stylistically, you know, this sort of intense collaboration you're speaking of that you have experienced within your career and then you, I think, have engendered in your projects and how that speaks to like finding a space and figuring out what can fill that space and what story needs to be told in that space <clears throat> through your style. Yeah, I mean, it's actually, that's been on my mind a lot right now, um, especially as we sort of stare down the barrel of the possibility that um, most theater venues won't be able to open, let's say, for the next year. Um, and so I've been thinking about how how kind of sad that is, and also what an incredible opportunity it presents um, to imagine the possibility that there would be, that the only thing that we would be able to go see right now or for the next year would be extremely visceral, intimate performances. Um, for 30 people at a time. Um, and that like, if that were the culture for the next year, I think it would have a big impact on redistributing the way that we consume culture um, and performance. And that, that's always been really important to me, partly, uh, especially in my work with, with opera and singers and music. Um, I think because I was exposed early on and a lot at Juilliard with like the force of what music does when it's close to you. Um, and so like, I always think about this moment, uh, my freshman year at Juilliard where I was working with a, a singer and it just struck me like she was so loud. <laughs> I mean, it was just incredible. <laughs> and it was this kind of like equals MC squared moment of like, you could not believe that that volume was coming out of that mass. And it shakes every bone in your body. And it just felt so exciting. And I thought, well, 
that isn't the experience that I have when I go to the Met or right. go to big opera houses, but that's the only experience I want. And um, so I think, I, and I think when, when you are struck, like really put into contact with that force, it's a bell you can't unring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that um, a lot of kind of matching uh, the container to the product, that's the, this is sort of like reductive way to say it, right? But um, we talk a lot about it in an Oberon context that so much work that comes through that we're like, yeah, this works like really incredible and, and would be really powerful in a chamber setting. But like this is a nightclub. And so just because this is great for a small audience and for an intimate setting doesn't mean it's great in here. Yeah. And I'm also, yeah, and I, I mean, I'm also really interested in access and like equity. And I, I feel like, you know, it's important to, to like explode the idea of what a theater is. I also love, you know, the surprise of encountering uh, like a piece like I did Cage in the X um, in a space that, you know, it, it's like we've I don't know that there's ever been like a single piano, <laughs> you know, in the center of that room with that focus but it brings a quality of attention that I find really exciting. And, you know, on the other side of it, like I, I, over the last couple of years, I've been really interested in parties as a great medium <laughs> for surprise. <laughs> um, and so, you know, one of the things that we do with the muck is like all of our, all of our like kind of fundraisers and parties are really just fun parties with like good drinks and good food. And then these sort of spontaneous eruptions of like really high level performance that is right in your face um, you know, for 10 or 15 minutes and it happens 10 different times. And I feel like that's how, that, like, I'd love to live in that world more often. And yeah. so every, every chance I have to make it, I try. We, um, <clears throat> a very famous playwright who I will not name. Um, I was sometime at ART, we were doing a project and, and I met them and was sort of like, I was a bit fanboying out, like, oh my God, your work's so incredible. I was so moved by this play. I was so moved by that, you know, kind of doing that thing. And they didn't really respond. To, to to any of it <laughs> like they're kind of like texting as i was you know fanboying over them and then i said something about like see you at the opening night party or see you at a party and and they just stopped me like parties i love parties <laughs> and i could never get past like that's all you got from this yeah and i mean you know and i think we'll, we'll again like we'll have to be thinking about this a lot more especially if we like are going to be living in a six-foot society but like the way we enter a theater and you know like what, just the, the way that the best theaters kind of like the, the experience really starts when you walk in the building, not just when you walk into the auditorium. Um, and I think it's really important to be thinking about that on every level. Like what is it when it happens spontaneously? What happens when you go into a space and it's utterly transformed or the thing inside of it is the least expected thing you could imagine putting in there? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that I want to get into a, a muck <clears throat> um, because this energy, I think, infuses so much of what that company is focused on doing. So a muck is a company that you started with Matt Acoin, um, who we all know, and you both stay as the co-artistic directors. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that genesis of like a, a new opera company that is so much more than opera. Um, kind of the impetus for creating that company and creating that space um, and what what that first conversation was between you and Matt to, to see the need for, for this company in particular. Yeah, well, it's something that I think we were both thinking about and wanting to make for a long time. Um, and for me personally, like, I, I'm, I don't know that so many people understand the insane way that opera is normally produced. Um, mm -hmm. what happens is that like, I get asked to, to direct a show and I am allowed to hire my design team, my lighting designer, set designer, costume designer, et cetera. But everything else is in the hands of the house. So they choose the cast, they choose the conductor, and it's this weird kind of matchmaking. And so what it amounts to is being asked to make something of very high quality, very quickly over four weeks, usually with a group of strangers. And there is the, always the possibility that that can there can be like a very perfect alchemy and you can make something of great depth and power. Um, but even if you do that, everyone sort of scatters to the wind afterwards. And having had the experience with Pina and looking up to people like Forsyth and feeling like that quality can only be attained after a commitment to one group of people working together over a long period of time, I really wanted to find a way to do that 
mm -hmm. um, inside of an interdisciplinary and operatic context. And there weirdly isn't much precedent for that, even though opera at its core is the most interdisciplinary form of performance we, we have. Um, and so we started to sort of, I started to have this conversation with a lot of friends um, and everyone sort of felt the same way. And so did Matt. And so when we sort of met, we just started talking about, you know, who would those people be? Who would the, the, the people who are most game, most exciting and most challenging and who we feel like we could work with forever? Um, and we said a lot of the same names <laughs> and they were people <laughs> who have been kind of working with um, separately from each other over the, the, the prior few years. So uh, we gathered the people. And I think the first, the first step was just like put the people in the room. Um, and so we, we kind of all gathered in my apartment in New York. And um, the basic idea was simply to commit to building a new body of discipline colliding work over a very long period of time together. Um, and it's, you know, it's become really like a, like a family and a home. There is this like, you know, because we'll get into the festival here in a minute, but there, there's this like sense of inquiry among you as a group of artists that always feels very shared, even knowing that you come from so many different disciplines. <clears throat> That's always what I've been struck by is that you, you share this like sense of investigation or drive or idea um, that feels very specific to that group of artists and is very exciting. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I always think about my job as being the remover of obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, like that, my job is really to listen and then to get everything out of the way. Um, and I think that's the general practice of the whole company is that we spend a lot of time listening to each other. It's not the me and Matt show. It was never intended to be our work, our company. It was intended to be an incubator for every single person in the core group, which is 17. And that when those people have something to say, we listen and then we sort of shape shift around that idea sure. to tell it. And one of the things that happens is, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at each other's work and being incredibly critical. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's something my parents also taught me. Um, <laughs> and um, so I think that, you know, we're, we're really, we're really invested in like interrogating each other's ideas um, and, and, and in an effort to support them. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Run Amok Festival, um, which, you know, was such a kind of exciting development and partnership um, between Amok and ART. Um, and I'm wondering, A, sort of where that festival landed in the um, birth of the company, <clears throat> and then kind of what the idea was behind that partnership of ART and Amok in creating that festival. Yeah, it's funny because I think it actually like almost preceded the birth of the company. Um, and, um, we were really like a name and a website. Um, and uh, when we kind of came in to have a conversation, um, you maybe remember this better than I do, but it was <laughs> with you and to Diane Borger. Um, and obviously like we, Matt and I both had a relationship with ART already. I mean, I think we both grew up going. Um, I remember a number of like really important performances, um, like Robert Lepage, the, this piece about the moon that was like a total game changer for me when I was in maybe even in middle school. Um, and Matt had obviously done Crossing with you guys already, starting to do Black Clown. Oh, wait um, a minute. Hello. <laughs> a surprise guest star. This feels very yeah. like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Borger has joined, executive producer for ART. Um, perfect timing, Diane, because we're just talking about the sort of genesis of the Run Amok Festival, which I know is a big conversation that you you were a part of with 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 um, Zach and Matt and Jen Chen. How did I, it start, Diane? <laughs> I, I, I actually looked up the dates. Okay, because when I was listening to you guys talk, I thought, wait. Um, because it did sort of start when it was just an idea because you had told me about it. And then I went to hear 
Matt play excerpts from Crossing at Music West in the, the summer of 17. And mm -hmm. it all happened around there that we hatched it. And the joke from my point of view was I, I couldn't resist doing anything that could be called run amok. So um, that was probably why I said, why don't we do a festival? Because I just want to use this name. And, um, and that was it. And it was, I know it was your first kind of major public performance. And that was in um, December of 17. I looked it up. Yeah. And so, so it was kind of, yeah. it was a kind of crazy leap of faith on your guys' part, because um, I, I mean, I know that you knew me and Matt and Jen and a couple of other, Devon, a couple of other people. Um, but I don't think you knew a lot of folks in the company. Mm -hmm. And we basically were saying, um, we don't have anything to show at all. But these are really good people. Trust us. The ingredients are good. The meal will be excellent. Um, and like, could we take over as many spaces as you're willing to give us for a weekend? Um, and it was our first, uh, our first major performances. Um, and also kind of helped to form the way that we think about presenting the company, which is that like the festival format is really best for us because we do so many smaller scaled pieces that are little portraits of individuals and little relationships and collaborations. And so they're each kind of one-offs that are bonbons and delicious and exciting. But if you come for like the entire weekend, you get a real kind of picture of the whole group. I think maybe what I said, because I knew Devon since I've worked here, Devon and I met in 2009. And I think I probably just said to you, make sure Devon sings a lot. <laughs> because then I then I know I'm safe, you know, yeah. and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and that's I, a very good description of what it was. Yeah, I, I missed the first one, um, and this I think started the I remember that recurring, recurring jokes act was that like I would do this work to set up whatever, and be like, oh, by the way, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be in this country or that country, which I think was maybe our first three projects together. That yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I skipped your out. Absence, and your absence was present. <laughs> um, so I, I want to make sure, you know, it's already 1230, which is kind of wild. And I want to make sure at the end we have enough time for questions from our viewers. Um, so I would love also to remind everyone that um, if you have questions, there's a Q&A box sort of at the bottom, bottom of your Zoom, um, and we'll come to those sort of in the, the last um, 15 or so minutes. So feel free to submit now and, and keep those coming and I'll um, kind of sift through and get to what we can um, in the time. Um, but with that being said, I thought it would be a good time for us to talk uh, about Black Cloud. Um, and this of course is a piece that we did about a year and a half ago. I think, I, I guess almost two years ago at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think it would be great, actually, Diane, since you've joined us, you were at sort of at that first moment with Devon um, when he played selections from the piece. Um, this is a, <clears throat> a piece, for those of you who don't know, that we, we did a few years ago, Zach directed. Uh, it was uh, music by Mike Schachter um, uh, and sort of conceived by Mike and Devon, um, starring Devon Tynes, um, and so an adaptation of the Langston Hughes poem of the same name. Um, and so I wonder, you know, Diane, if you can talk about that first moment, and Zach, if you can talk a little bit about, um, give us some more context for the poem, but also your kind of initial reaction to hearing um, from Devon and Mike that this project existed and, and this adaptation was happening and, and how you first thought about how audiences needed to receive that or should receive that. Um, Devon was in Crossing for us in the spring of, 2015. And when he was here, he said to me that he and Mike were working on what was then a song cycle um, for of the of based on the Langston Hughes poem. And he came back to campus, I don't remember why, sometime that autumn. And he said, Do you want to hear it? And I was like, All right, yeah, sure, great. And we went down to the X lobby. So on that untuned piano. And, and Mike wasn't here. He was getting his doctorate at the University of Michigan. So some local pianist came and how he played that score is like, a, you know, a feat when I look back on it. And Devon sang all of the cycle to me in the X lobby. And it was so overwhelming. And I had asked my colleague, Ryan McKittrick, to come with me. I was like, 
it's going to be weird. If this is terrible, I'm just going to be sitting there listening to Devon. So um, needless to say, it was a breathtaking experience. And then I spent, by my own confession, about a year and a half saying Zach shouldn't direct it. <laughs> so I didn't really know Zach then. And yeah. Devon was always like, you have to have this guy called Zach. I said, let me see a CV. Okay, you're writing for the, you're doing this with Mike for the first time. This person looks like they're very young, doesn't have that much experience yet, before I knew you. And um, I resisted and resisted and resisted. Uh, we talked to a lot of other people. And then the minute that we met, I knew that Zach was indeed the right idea. So um, I admit that it took from 2015 for a while to get on to the next part of the story, which is where you come in. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I think similarly, um, I remember being in Vermont poolside with Devon, which is where we do a lot of best thinking. Um, and he was telling me about this project and um, I thought it was a really brilliant idea. Um, and then he said, do you, you know, would you be interested in directing this? And I said, I am absolutely not the right person for this period. So we were having the same thought, Diane. Um, and I think good, that good, good. about a year and a half. Um, and Devon and I were talking about it uh, a lot. Um, I was hearing about it. I, you know, read the poem. We talked through different versions and treatments of the story. Um, and then at a certain point, um, I remember uh, Devon's best thinking happens in the shower. And um, he called me from the shower and said, I really, you have, you just, you have to do this. Um, I don't really trust anyone else to do this. It's, it's so personal to me. Um, and it, that sort of was a turning point because I, I realized that um, there, was a, there was a way for me to, to, to meet this material. And that was as like Devon's friend um, and based on a relationship of many years and a lot of mm -hmm. trust. And um, I think from there, you know, Diane and I met and we talked a lot about the show and what it was and where it needed to go. And, um, and then Mike and Devon and I just started kind of hashing through different versions of how it could happen. Um, and then we had a workshop. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I think, um, there were a couple of things that we found in that workshop where I think we knew that it was something really special. And that was, um, 300 years when we had mm -hmm. based on the kind of Kara Walker imagery, we had designed a, a less good than Chanel ended up making version of 300 years in silhouette. Um, and we also had, um, remember having the idea to do motherless child as a, um, as a second line. Yeah. And we, we did that, uh, in the, like an empty auditorium with just, I think me and you. Me. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, and Mark was, was away. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you were. Never longer, were. <laughs> and, um, and I think we realized that this, this, this was really something special and that we could actually do, uh, we could actually accomplish something that I, th I thought was really th like one sort of technical feat, which was just to make a 70 plus minute show based on the 347 word poem without adding any extra text at all. This adaptation is, is part opera, part music theater. It's this kind of choreo poem. It's got elements of chamber concert. And so... I wonder, as a director, sort of your, um, I hesitate to call it a burden, but your, your challenge of like sort of mixing and mingling through genre, it kind of goes back to the theme we've been talking about in this entire conversation and, and your interest in doing just that. Um, but talk a little bit about how you infuse so much different genre type into this piece. Well, a lot of it actually was just taking the cues from Hughes. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the earliest decision made was really not to add anything to his language. And um, the, the poem is uh, unusual in the sense that it's, it happens in two columns. One is the poem and the other is what he calls the mood. And the mood is essentially stage directions. Um, and I thought what made a lot of sense about this project from the beginning was that it felt like it was actually just finishing Hughes's project since a lot of the ways that he was um, doing readings around the country uh, while he was writing poems like this was actually with choirs and with jazz musicians. And so singing and dancing and moving, it was really like an attempt 
to basically use every theatrical resource available to him to tell the story, speak the poem in the most compelling way possible. And so I feel like we took a lot of cues from that. And, um, you know, a lot of the, like the, the, the dramaturgy of the show is essentially Langston Hughes' dramaturgy. And a lot of the cues that Mike took for the music is from the mood. Um, and so it didn't feel like we were, you know, trying very hard to kind of mix up and collide different genres or blur the lines at all. It was kind of already inside of the piece and we just had to uncover it. Yeah. And Diane, I wonder if you can speak a little bit because I think what's also so interesting about this piece is like <clears throat> it comes with so many incredible ideas that this creative team has admitted they don't necessarily know at the outset how that's all going to package together. And so as a producer, you know, when you would sort of hold on to that <clears throat> in a traditional way of wanting to see, I, I think a lot of producers would have maybe wanted to see something more concrete. I think I, I feel having learned and from you and worked for you for so long that you get pulled into these like greater ideas and the sort of healthy dose of the unknown. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit about specifically with Black Clown. Um, I, I don't know. I, you know, it's sort of what I do. So it's hard for me to think about it in a way that I'm good at articulating it. But for me, it always starts first with the words because I'm that person. And once I understood the poem, you know, going back to when Devon introduced me to it and understood that it was a historical perspective and then getting that creative team of artists that I could trust, it always felt though, more almost than any project I've ever done. So I mean, every time I see the clips, I get like so moved. It felt like the greatest leap of faith and also perhaps the most rewarding. So it it's just, but it's what I've done for a long time. So sometimes I think what things are, what I would say, oh, that's an instinct. I think it's just experience over 30 years of like, look at the work, trust the artist, figure out the conditions in which they can flourish. So that was tick, tick, tick on this one, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, I thought we might get into some questions here um, from our lovely viewers. So <clears throat> there are two questions that I'm gonna ask together because I think, um, and they're, they're both for you, Zach. Um, but, uh, well, I'll ask them separately, and we'll see if they cross over. <clears throat> um, so the first is from Maria Whitcomb. And Maria asks, um, the Black Clown is an incredible space, space for Black identity. How did you acknowledge the fact that you were a white person with a leadership role in a Black space? And how did you add your allyship to the creative process? Um, additionally to that, what advice would you have for others who want to advocate for stories that aren't theirs with purpose and awareness? This is such a good question. and. I think, you know, to be blunt about it, the reason that neither I nor Diane at the beginning of this thought that I should be the director was because I'm white. Um, and we basically, the, the kind of change happened when Devon really like asked me to yeah. take it on and um, like as, a, as an act of like friendship and trust. And I think what I needed to acknowledge right off the bat, which is that is exactly this, which is that, you know, there were a lot of questions that I would simply never have the answer to. And that is um, really important to acknowledge from the outset and also to be able to frame and meet the material in a way that allows for these stories to be told um, without editorializing, without making a glossary and really just letting it speak itself. Um, so we did a lot of talking and uh, the, the cast did a lot of talking and I did a huge amount of listening and a huge amount of learning. Um, and I really took my lead from the, the, the folks who were performing um, because those, that's how I make everything is like you, you can only make the work on the people in the room. I think the other important thing to acknowledge, though, is that the beginning of the poem is you laugh because I'm poor, black and funny, not the same as you. Hughes was writing for a white audience. And one of the things that Devon and I talked about very early on was that it was being written for a white audience and not exclusively white, but it was talking to someone different, you. Fronting whiteness in a certain way. Yeah. And so, you know, in one way, 
I remember Devon saying, it's really important that we have one white person in the room <laughs> because we need, we need that. We need, to, we need to have that perspective as well. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a similar question that I, I think um, kind of ties into the same conversation. This is from um, Xavier Dumain. Um, and he says that um, as a black man, he connected so deeply to the black clown and how the story was told. And, and he thanks you for your beautiful direction. Um, but he asks uh, kind of a similar question as a white artist, what drew you uh, to this, to bringing this story to the stage? And how did you navigate tackling the difficult racial issues that the piece takes on? Yeah. Well, I mean, generally speaking, I, I do like to take on projects that I, I don't know that much about. Um, because I, I like to learn, um, and I like to learn from people. Um, so that, that was part of my interest. I've also just been a huge fan of Langston Hughes's poems. And I thought this was an unusual one. Um, one that I understood as a, as a, like a theatrical object. Um, and that also kind of talked about the past, the present and the future. Um, and, uh, would sort of never be less than very, very real forever. Um, and it was also a poem I didn't know. Um, and very few people did, um, I think before the show actually. Um, and the other was again, like this, this conversation with Devon and like wanting to really hear his story and be able to hear other people's stories, um, and, uh, be, feel really uncomfortable sometimes. Um, and to basically make sure that that like part of, I felt like part of my responsibility was to make sure that the audience felt the same things that I was feeling in the room, um, in terms of like joy, discomfort, and all of it combined. Um, it was a, it was, it was definitely a, one of the harder experiences I've ever had, um, in terms of trying to, you know, th this, this, this show brings up a lot and asks the performers essentially to do something that I try, I think is really essential to all of my work, but is particularly difficult in this case, which is like to collapse the distance between the people and the character that they are on stage. And this poem evoked so much for the cast from the beginning as themselves. And it was asking them to basically pour their whole being into that vessel. Um, and I think, you know, there was a, there was a lot of conversation and a lot of discussion and, uh, before any action took place. Yeah. I mean, and that cast too, being so kind of brave and generous in the sharing <clears throat> and really sort of being, uh, so game to share so much of that experience in sort of the creation of these characters. Yeah. Can I, say yeah, yeah. I just want to add that it was um, hard at first. So it, the workshop, especially as we navigated what it meant, because as Zach acknowledged, I was uncomfortable with a white person directing this show who might have not have had the direct experience. And Devon, I swear, the biggest arguments we've ever had were those two years of him saying it has to be Zach and me now feeling like, oh, was I being, you know, imperial telling me couldn't have what he wanted for his play. I examined my conscience many times on that one. Um, but the conversations were really, really hard, especially. And there was a conversation every single day. And the work always ended. Sorry, the work kept going. The rehearsal time ended a half an hour early. So there could be the session of questions, reflections, writings, anything that came up that people, either on a personal level or on a Zach level or on a me level, they had a space that they could say it every day without any, um, I'm sure there was anxiety, but without, you know what I mean? They could say it freely. And we started the day that way too. Yeah, exactly. A, a lot of, a lot of reading and writing, um, mm. And, you know, there was, there was just like a real process every single day in terms of like entering this studio. Yeah. Um, so uh, sort of moving away from Black Clown for the moment, <clears throat> we have a, a question from Nina Pongrantz who says, um, I love how you mentioned intimate shows of 30 people during this unprecedented time. How do you think a potential shift in audience sizes will impact the work that you and maybe other artists make? 
How will this shift in size, for example, impact budget and therefore content? Or the kind of audience member that might show up? Will theater, dance, opera become even more elite, expensive, and accessible than before? What do we think about this culture shift impacting the performing arts? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I, I keep thinking about how um, at this moment when we're being told where A, culture isn't really being made. Um, and, and I don't think that's ever happened before. You know, like after 9-11, after Sandy, it was like you went to performances to have a kind of spiritual communion with other people. And now that's not happening. And we're also being told that being together and touching each other is bad. Um, so I think it, it'll, it'll be up to us to lead the charge in making that okay again and in redefining what intimacy is and how we are okay with our bodies um, and with each other in community. Um, and it sort of has the potential to make what we do like a luxury commodity. Right. Um, and that's worrisome. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that the possibilities of having a more intimate performance experience um, would really change the way that we go into the theater generally. Um, you know, like I feel so lucky when I'm in rehearsal that I'm, you know, two feet away from these performers and part of the like shock of it and the phenomenon and the force and the power comes from being so close. And I think that if that were to happen for a while, um, we'd want it more, which I think is good. Yeah. Um, I think that there are a lot of questions about access and I think there are a lot of questions about budget and, you know, expenses. Um, but I, I hope that it means we also have to distill and make more essential uh, decisions about how and what comprises theater and storytelling. You know, that it, it, it does not need to be spectacle-based, but it can be people-based. And that is something we desperately need now. And so again, like removing the obstacles, making like the clearest gesture, simplest gestures that have the biggest impact um, in order to front the people and their stories and their voices and their bodies. Um, feels like something that we could really do and that would be exciting and might even transport, transfer to larger theaters. Um, but I, I think it's really important if we are to go down this path of doing smaller shows for only 30 people, that they be affordable and that they run for long enough <laughs> that as many people as possible can come and it's, it, it, it doesn't just become a sport for rich people. We, um, a, a few years ago, we did a, a festival of work. Um, called the mini festival, the mini series, I think is what it was called actually. And it was focusing on theater for small audience. And I was the one on the artistic team who was sort of famously like, oh, I don't know about that small audience thing. <laughs> and now I'm like eating those words in this moment because it's so essential to the work we're doing. Um, but I think you're right about a lot of those questions you need to be answered because frankly, that's what I feel like all I do right now is <clears throat> think about how to make work in that time, in, the, in these times institutionally and answer some of those questions. I think I could speak for Diane, it's the thing, same is true for her. And we've been trying to really kind of zoom out and say, okay, rather than really focusing on taking the thing that we know how to do in a proscenium theater and like bend it and break it to comply with certain restrictions or certain governance or, or advice from the CDC, how do we like just set that over here and like do something completely different and just completely break out of the mold and think differently about how we're sharing the art with an audience. Um, because that could actually create such exciting invention <clears throat> versus trying to be like, how can we still do this thing in the lobe? If only if everyone has to sit six feet apart, you know, of course we're still considering that question too, but not getting obsessed with solving that and actually thinking like, okay, let's pivot. How do we do this? I also, I, I feel like recently I've, I found it very helpful to speak in the framework of risk and like remembering that um, there's a little bit of a mythology about larger institutions being the place where um, real change and risk happens. Um, and that like something like, you know, Rite of Spring, it simply, there is no institution that could pull that off anymore because the risk is too big. Mm -hmm. And that's a fact of capitalism, and that's also a fact of our culture. And what has been true for a long time is that the risk is therefore incurred by smaller institutions that are nimble 
and by individual artists. And I think it's a really good moment to put that front and center and remember that the gatekeepers should not be institutions, but should be those people who are capable of incurring the risk because those are the people we need more than ever. And it's an opportunity to, to fast track that change, um, which I think could have a profound impact. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, there's a question, Diane, for you and I that says, when will Black Clown ever be available for streaming? <laughs> Ask equity. <laughs> <laughs> um, I promise you it'll be one of the first I ever show. Yeah. It brings so much joy to the world right now. I always figure if I could stream six and Black Clown, people would be really happy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. I might also just take this opportunity to do a shameless. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Please, please do. Please do. Just, um, that it, it won't be the full show by any means, but um, Devon and I are working uh, with Lincoln Center and um, hopefully WQXR to start a podcast um, that'll happen in six episodes about the Black Clown and particularly about the poem, kind of more than the show. So um, myself and other creative team members, as well as many of the cast, will be joining on that. So I hope that it'll kind of launch at the end of May. Um, but stay tuned for it because it'll be um, an opportunity to sort of dive deeper into these stories and what it was like in the room and what this poem evokes for the folks who were in the show. Yeah, yeah. We'll definitely amplify that on our um, social media accounts as well, just so folks know it's coming. That's that's incredible. Um, and then uh, there's a question here about high schools doing Black Clown. The Black Clown seems to me like a production that could be healing for communities. I immediately think of how high schools can take this work and produce their own version. How do we think that would happen? Good question. It's a great question. <laughs> I mean, were you gonna say something, Porter? No, I was just trying to think where Mike is with the licensing because the person who can license that is the composer. And so I'm going to ask him that question. He's a fellow at Harvard right now. And although I don't see him, I'm in touch. I mean, we text. So I'll be interested to know what the thinking is about when he might license it for um, for wider use. Yeah. I'd also just encourage like, um, you know, the there are other poems that take this shape uh, that have the mood and the the poem. And I think, you know, um, even if it wasn't possible to do this production or like to use this music and to kind of restage the piece in a high school, I think the idea of really diving into a poem and gathering all the kind of possible available theatrical and storytelling resources to kind of dive deep into text is a beautiful thing <laughs> and should happen more often. And I, I hope that other people take on that uh, way of, of working and exploring and, and analyzing poetry. Incredible. Um, there's one more question I wanna, I wanna get to because I am excited about it and I know we have a minute left. Um, <clears throat> very under question about the Black Clown. Uh, unbeknownst to me, I happen to be sitting right next to one of the cast members. Uh, in the audience at the beginning of the show and was pleasantly surprised when she started singing and emerged from the crowd. Can you talk about the motivation behind that creative choice? Um, yeah, so that's Haley, mm -hmm. one of the most formidable people I've ever met. Um, and we we knew that later in the show, like the, the fourth wall would be broken and people would be processing through the space. Um, and I wanted to make sure that people felt like they were being looked at from the beginning. Um, and so we tried it out a couple of different ways, but um, we really loved the possibility of not just having Devon standing up there looking at the audience saying, you laugh, but being able to have one person stare down their neighbor and say it to them and say, you are in this, we're all in this together, and I have my eyes on you, and it's not from a distance. Right, right. Well, Zach, I'm just taking pictures of the questions we didn't get to, so we, we'll try to answer those offline and send those out with a follow-up email. That's why you're hearing the weird little camera click. Um, <clears throat> I thank you, everyone. I know we're, we're right at one o'clock. Zach, thanks so much for coming on. This was such a blast. Thank you. This is a pleasure. Yeah. I love seeing you guys. And I'm sure we're in the at Diane Borger to, to, to bomb in. 
<laughs> I invoke you so many times, Diane, that it was, uh, I think. Oh, well, here you are. You're in the fourth episode. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay, your, your surprise Mr. Rogers appearance is really exciting. Um, thank you all for watching. Um, we're gonna be back next week. Um, and we're gonna have a very special guest next week. Um, Maria Goyanas, the artistic director at Willie Will 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 Mammoth will be joining me. Um, a longtime partner of ours and her career and we're excited to speak to her. So uh, until then, thank you all for tuning in again. And as always for your support of ART and we'll talk soon. Thanks all. Thanks everyone. Bye.